grand strategy, the organization of immense means in pursuit of great ends over a very, very long time. I mean, I think you rightly capture the dilemmas of the southern flank. Uh, in my 2017 book, The Geopolitics of Terror, which is brilliant and very reasonably priced, um, <laughs> um, we, thank you very much. Uh, William Hopkinson and I looked at the policy options and to make any change on our southern flank will require a very, very long generational engagement. Consistency, large investment, sustained strategy, and they're precisely the things that Europeans are not very good at. And I, I suspect more than the northern flank, the southern flank will be the true, the true test of that. Well, gentlemen, thank you very much. We've had four excellent introductory presentations. You know, the, the title, as you know, of this session is Reform or Retreat, can Western institutions survive? And what you've given us are, are, are four lines of operation. We had Andrew talking about the uns growing uncertainty in, in, the, in, in the transatlantic relationship and the sense of quo vadis US security, foreign and security policy. We had Ashley talking about what role Europe in a multipolar world, but then is there a Europe? I mean, there's certainly an America, but, but this, this almost inclination to suggest that there's an America and a Europe. I, I certainly don't see a, a, a Europe uh, in that sense. And then Espen talking about fundamentals, geoeconomics. You know, we, we security wonks can bang on about defense spending, but ultimately the basis of power is geoeconomics. And, and where does a Europe that somehow doesn't want to compete fit into this changing world order? Is Europe's inability to adapt is Europe's protectionist tendency uh, uh, implicit in the EU in time self-defeating. And I, I think Henrik was right. I mean, what you see on the southern flank is an enormous challenge to Europeans. But Europeans have got to get their head around the enormity of that challenge and its complexity before we start to help, in partnership, ameliorate some of those issues. So the question, gentlemen, that I have for all of you is what institutions, how do they adapt? To what end and with whom? And how do you see, for example, NATO and the EU in 10, 15 years' time? Let me start with Espen, because you've been a, a minister, Espen, and, and, and you face these, these fundamental policy questions. And because I've known you for so long, I can dump a very tough question on you. <laughs> Uh, they are both there in uh, 15 years, I'm quite certain. Uh, the question is, with institutions like that is not whether they will go away, it's what, uh, what emphasis, relative emphasis you put into them. And so far, of course, the EU is the key uh, integrator of Europe in the economic plus area, and NATO is the primary security, and, and the, they are currently not challenged. But, but it is an open question, uh, the extent to which they will carry the weight of convincing policy change. I mean, making countries do things they otherwise wouldn't have done yeah. because we agree that the summit, that's the question, not whether, the, not whether we'll have the summits because we have, <laughs> we have enough people to send to summits and, you of know, and we like we like We're very good at summits. Yeah, so, yeah. so, so, they, so it's the, and there are institutions out there, we don't need to mention names, there are institutions who are still there, but who do not necessarily, I mean, I, I was actually present when we closed down the West European Union in order to transfer its powers to to, um, so was to I. the I was EU, yeah, for it. exactly. Uh, of course, and and then there was there was a parliamentary assembly of the West European Union. They enjoyed so much being a parliamentary assembly that they're still there. So there <laughs> is a parliamentary yeah, assembly yeah. of nothing in a sense. Which, uh, um, so I mean, institutions tend to survive. Um, but I do I do think that NATO and the EU will fare better. But of course, EU has to find its. Um, uh, I mean, a lot of EU wonks will be saying has been saying for many years that it's it's some kind of this equilibrium between its ambitions and its reality, between having a cur common currency but not completely a common economic policy and so on. So it will have to make a choice on whether to go deeper or, or in the other direction. And I think the other direction would spur disintegrate, political disintegration, so I think it's doomed to get closer. And maybe, maybe the answer is closer on what is most essential and then not try to do everything yeah. else as well. Yeah, and and, uh, and but, NATO. But, but, but I mean, can I, I, get, can I, I press you on the EU question yeah. while, you, while you're there. I mean, is there not a, a role for the EU and its member states 
to convince others of the importance of institutions yes. per se. Because let's face it, if we have a balance of power world, it exaggerates extremes. The purpose of institutions is to limit extremes. Yeah. And, and the EU will always be a defender of multilateralism on the global stage. Mm -hmm. it, has, it is, but it has to because it is multilateral in its uh, essence. Yes, indeed. So there's, you know, to have a unilateralist EU policy is, you know, is, uh, unimaginable because it, it won't make sense. You won't have 28 or 27 countries voting for, let's go for a unilateralist uh, uh, approach. So it has to, and, and I think that's its major contribution to the world, that it will remain a carrier of big items like... Paris Agreement and so on. And, and let me just mention energy, as I work a lot on energy these days. Yeah. The EU has strong and sound ideas of uh, reducing uh, dependence on uh, fossil fuel and dependence on Russia at the same time. They, they come together, as, as was said in the previous panel. Um, that's possible because technology is really leading that way. Solar power, uh, wind power is becoming cheaper, actually, than coal, even coal from an existing coal plant. However, uh, whereas uh, you can put the coal plant beside the factory or wherever you like, you have to put the wind turbines where the wind blows and the wave can only require waves and, and sun uh, power requires sun. So, so you need a more integrated approach to European energy. So here you can see a policy that has at least declared purpose to become more Paris compatible, may also change the neighborhood of exporting countries. No worries, Norway. We, they will still buy our gas for many years because gas is an important part of that change. But in the long, long term, uh, we will see a different energy Europe. And these are things that can only happen in a Europe that has the trust of sharing. You know, you need, this is more than what you can just do between two countries who have a transactional relationship because you need to know that the supply will still be there yeah. in difficult times. Can, and, can, uh, I, can I just park and, that? And, and this is where I think the EU can actually do, do important things, which will also define its purpose for people. Yeah, thank you, Esther. I think the point you're making there is also is, is that the ongoing institutional adaptation of the EU will suck up an awful lot of European political energy yeah. because it's, you know, it is the project for Europeans right now. But yes. you know, let, me, let me switch this across the Atlantic because the ongoing European obsession with institutional adaptation is not going to be top of the US political agenda. So how do you, Andrew, see the transatlantic relationship evolving in the, in the coming years, specifically how the US instrumentalizes both EU and NATO, as it should in pursuit of its own national interests. Since you did a product placement plug, I'm going to plug something. That hey, I've man, written. go ahead. Plug uh, away. I wrote a piece for the American interest about six months ago um, with the title, Stop Sweating Institutions Fix Relationships. Uh, I would actually argue, and I don't know if my European colleagues will agree with this, that especially with post-Lisbon EU, EU is to a large extent over-engineered. The European kind of gut response to any crisis is let's, let's build another institution, let's restructure, let's... More acronyms. More acronyms. If, yeah. we have, if we have a deficit of military power, let's create headquarters, preferably in a chateau, and you know, that's going to go in that direction. I think what Europe needs right now, if I am to answer in the positive, where the EU will be in, in, in say, a decade from now, is uh, for leaders to get on planes, go to different capitals, and talk literally talk face to face, fix relationships, because the kind of fracturing that you see is to a large extent not a function of institutional deficiencies. The rebellion that you see uh, in Europe and to a large extent in my own country, it's the rebellion against the established patterns and ways of doing business. Uh, and I think the ability for the elites to reconnect with the electorate rests to a large extent on their ability to reconnect with each other. Redesigning, you know, Europe of three tiers, 15 tiers, 17 tiers, and the sky with diamonds, you know, all this kind of stuff is perhaps useful, but not for the time of crisis. The time of crisis is where relationships really need to kick in. Uh, and I'm sitting here saying this to my British friend. Relationships matter, and our history kind of bears this out, and I think this, this is what has to be done. On NATO, um, a colleague of mine at AEI about a year ago, I think, did some calculations. And uh, his, his conclusion was that about 15 years ago, NATO Europe provided close to half of all the usable capabilities of the alliance. Uh, right now, it's about 25% yeah. or less. Um, 
if NATO doesn't get that right again, uh, meaning, and it's also kind of baffling because Europe is spending quite a bit of change when it comes to its defense. You know, it, uh, I was having this conversation, I think, with Uli over dinner. You know, a 2% GDP budget for Germany, that's the size of the Russian budget, pretty much. And it changes, changes the whole conversation. So the size of your economies is what matters in, in this conversation. But the gap that's opened up, the, the, especially at the high end of the spectrum, in the emerging multi-domain uh, theater that we're looking at. This is no longer mill-mill, as the military people in this audience know very well. Uh, it's cyber, it's, it's communications, it's legal. I mean, the conflict is now really multi-domain and multi-dimensional. And if NATO is not capable to actually provide value, then we will have some really rough waters going forward, I think. Do you think it's fair to say, I mean, I, I would go even further and say that I see evidence of certain countries you and I know well stepping outside the NATO institutional framework and, and informal coalitions becoming more, like Five Eyes, mm. more important because they can do business there. If, if the institutions don't adapt, are not quick enough to cope with an accelerating world timeline, that they will wither and die. Is that, is that an exaggeration? Well, that's what concerns me, Edward. What also concerns me, and something that has not been touched in this conversation, granted I came a day late, so maybe it has. Um, we've lost the momentum as the West, because we're speaking about the collective West, uh, of what I call the West to East enlargement. Even when I read the debates on NATO enlargement, Pro-NATO commentators are using the English term expansion, which was coined by the Russians to actually narrate what we were doing. We used, when I worked NATO enlargement, we worked on NATO enlargement as a bottom-up process where free, free nations were asking to become members. And rather than having this conversation redefined on our terms, um, that momentum of enlarging markets, democratic institutions, was blunted in 2008 with the Georgia, uh, Russia-Georgia war, and then post-Ukraine has been reversed. Uh, and sometimes when I talk to politicians, I, I sense, maybe I'm overstating this, but almost a buyer's remorse that what used to be a political exercise, yeah. it's actually a real security issue now on which the entire alliance rides. And I, and I hope that the whole approach to military power as part of the whole spectrum of statecraft needs to change for NATO to continue to thrive going forward. This is not just about, you know, deterrence by tripwire and messaging. As I said earlier, if you don't exercise capabilities, I mean, uh, Julian mentioned reforger, you know. Where is refor Bolt, refor Pole, refor yeah. Lithuania, Ref you know, all these things that we've exercised over and over again. Germany remains the main entry point for U.S. armed forces into Europe to this day. If you look at the infrastructure that was largely dismantled as peace dividend, all of this has to be rebuilt. NATO is setting up eight new logistical centers. All of this has to be done, but it requires the recognition, I think, at the, at the level of leadership that, as Julian has argued, I think, for several years now, building a military without allowing for and hoping that it will not happen, but allowing for the likelihood that you may actually have to use it someday, then it's simply a political exercise. That's right. Let me, let me turn to Ashley, because I, I want to turn your eloquence, as it were, around, Ashley, on this issue of creating Europe. Um, structure follows power, and power has consequences. Do you think that Europeans, with their focus on the institutionalization of Europe, sometimes fail to see how that impacts on their periphery. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm fascinated by the fact that, you know, with Britain leaving the EU, for example, you've got three major peripheral European powers now, all of whom have some difficulty in one way or another with the idea of Europe that you were implying with this idea of Europe in the world. Do you think we're sufficiently sensitive to the, the geopolitical implications of our institution building? Oh, so certainly not. Uh, but that's 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 sort of the the tragedy of of international politics that mm. the big powers uh, uh, and the big beasts in the system are are never really 
thinking much about how they influence other countries. That really brought, was brought home to me uh, once I, for the first time, visited Iceland. Uh, and I came to this country that cares so desperately about what Norway does, and I had to tell them that, frankly, we never think about you. Uh, and, nice. I, I, and, and you were never invited back. And I do like I, I do like Iceland a lot. Uh, I'm, uh, my family comes from the West, so... He does they, like Iceland you, a lot. You know, being, being slightly <laughs> misanthropic and, and overly blunt is something that we share, yeah. and, uh, and they found it an enamoring. It, can I, can I please say, say so? The, the, the main point here, the problem here, the problem here is that we join at these kind of conferences, and we all agree that institutions are a jolly good thing, and it's sort of you know like a, we we're all converted on that, and then we go on uh, to say what should these institutions do for us now? You know something big, preferably. The problem here is that institutions all over are suffering from a ringing lack of endorsement. And this endorsement is, is centers around this key word, legitimacy. Right. When we crafted That's these right. institutions, the, the institutions were designed with a series of checks and balances that were, in order, it were supposed to filter the aspirations from below uh, while giving guidance uh, from above. And all over we see that the the bigger uh, entities are, are sort of brushing up against the fences. You see it with the American president and the American d domestic system, you know, the, rule, the rule of law. We see it within NATO where, uh, how did NATO suddenly get involved in Afghanistan? You know, this, how did that tie in with the le legitimacy? We see it within the EU where the Germans, uh, uh, German preferences made the uh, commission put QMV vote on the distribution of migrants, which, a lot of countries felt was an abuse of, of, of power. I'm not saying that all of these things were, were wrong. I'm just, just saying that we need to be honest about uh, answering the question, how did we lose legitimacy and how can we restore the, it? And I think the only way to get to the fun part that we all enjoy discussing, where, where to from here, Unfortunately, before we can get to the dessert, we need to eat our potatoes and we need to be very frank and honest about uh, what went wrong and how did we lose the legitimacy that, uh, that is necessary for us to, um, to move ahead once we agree on the direction. So yeah, thank you. I think, yeah. It, I think there is a democracy deficit, but I think that somewhere along the way we got... Uh, a bit macronized, uh, you know, a bit like uh, Emmanuel Macron. We, got, we all got pretty excited. It, you know, like after the end, of, after, you know, like as, as Espen pointed out, you know, the wall fell and it was just such a surge and enthusiasm. I mean, the world was kind of open to be made anew. And we have to, we have to owe up to the fact that we were kind of storming ahead without really checking if, if everybody were following in uh, behind us. And then suddenly we found ourselves, so you know, like banner in hand and going like, hey, where's everybody? <laughs> and, you, and, and our solution is, hey, you should really, it's, this is where it's at. You know, like, come on, you know, institutions are great. And a lot of people don't think institutions are great. Uh, and we need, to, we need to answer that question. Sorry. I made two points before I go to Henrik uh, <laughs> on that. One is, uh, Macron is a great man. He reminds me of Tony Blair, kind of 1998, whose ambitions were far greater than his country. Uh, and that was always his, <laughs> always his tragedy that his ambitions were, 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 were far greater than this country. And the second point, I've completely forgotten. So I'll go to Henrik. Um, Henrik, you talk about grand strategy in the South, but that's policy. So what does a European policy look like that would even begin to address some of the structural issues across MENA, which are fundamental European security issues? Well... I think I would start with, with two uh, preconditions to that. And the first one is what the one Asla mentioned, namely legitimacy. And I think, I think this has to do with actually trying to solve people, problems that people actually care about. Yeah. And I think the, the, the migration issue since 2015 has become the salient political and strategic problem in Europe, and it's tearing Europe apart, east to west, north to south. So uh, this is a hot potato, and we have to talk about it also in strategic terms. So that's the first precondition. The second one, I think, has to do with the problem of strategy making in Europe. And since there's no unitary actor, as we talked about and as as, as eloquently uh, explained, we have to imagine a process in which we can actually make an overarching agenda that, that the different institutions that chip in agree to. And we have um, a prehistory of that. Yeah. So during the Cold War, the American grand strategy was containment, but there was not one strategy document that everybody referred to in any kind of formal way. Well, there was an agreement across the different actors that were involved that this was the project we were working on. So we can do the same thing again. 
what that necessitates is, of course, a shared sense of, of threat perception. And I think that's far harder to produce. One, one problem with let, the let me, let me push you on that. Is okay. the lack of shared threat perception really a lack of shared threat perception? Or because our politicians, present company accepted, of course, haven't got the guts to really look at the sheer scale of the problem with which they're faced and what they might have to tell their populations is needed to deal with it. But that, that's the same thing, I think. I think really? the, the, yeah. pro the problem, that was what I referred to as, as looking further ahead than the, than the reef immediate ahead of the, ahead of the ship. I, I, think, um, I, I think we have a, the usual problem with democracies is that, that the politicians think mostly about the, the, the short term. And I think there is a responsibility for the strategic community to have a sustained debate about actual problems that are further ahead than, uh, than what's immediately ahead of us, the next summit, for example. Mr. Politician, do you want to respond yes, to that? I uh, strongly insist that some politicians think long ahead. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I, I don't think that's a universal statement, but uh, it, it does occur, of course. Uh, you always have to be refreshing in, in, other, in other parties. <laughs> 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 Um, I think uh, us, I mean, there's the gist of this is very important, and Asle is spot on on this image of the the leaders of the pack with the, running with the flag and saying Hallelujah, we're we're united and integrated, and where, where's everybody? I think that's quite spot on. Uh, actually, I mean, just to remind you, a lot of people was on board for quite a while. It wasn't like immediately, but I do think that in the way something happened, and that connects to your theme, and it's it's uh, almost difficult to talk about, but there was a decoupling between nation and state, what I mean here is not the classical, is it a na I mean, this is not the political science discussion about whether uh, it's one or a multi-nation state, but the, the, the perception of an imagined community that I more or less understood, even, uh, you know, Benedict Anderson's point, I, I, I don't know all the other Brits or Norwegians, but I think they belong to a we, which I, I can define, I, I can hold it, yeah. and I am willing to, be so, uh, to provide solidarity through the tax system and so on to some other people, because I, I kind of get the universe. Mm -hmm. Now, with migration, but not only migration, with integration in general, uh, a lot of people have benefited, but other people have felt, what happened to my club? Suddenly there's a lot of new people in the club. That's not necessarily racist. It, it, it That's can, right. it, it, it's simply, you know, my my sense of who this we is that I'm supporting with my tax bill, with my work and so on, is gone. And, and how come these other people suddenly have all the rights that we became from as building? And, and, and um, the center and the left uh, and liberals have had trouble in capturing this problem. The, the answer is not close the borders, but the, but the answer is some kind of organized process so that we maintain a we, even if it slowly expands. And it's interesting to see the difference between perception of migration from early autumn 15 to late autumn 15. First, we had this image of the dead little boy on Bodrum Beach. Everybody was in favor of let's help these poor Syrian people. And then, they all, then there was a perception again of massive inflows that would never stop, you know, images of, of uh, you know, an, uh, an enormous queues. And, 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 the, and then this it turned all the, the other way around. And, uh, of course, those people who already decided that close the border is the answer, they had an easy time. But this is a challenge because without a perception of some kind of a community that I can capture, uh, we, this is a key reason why people don't trust their leaders any longer. And because they don't trust the leader, the problem is not the international institution's legitimacy. It's the national leaders who meet because they, their relationship is normally quite good. I mean, even if they disagree on a single, uh, particular votes, they form an international community of leaders who think institution is good. The problem is their connection to their electorate, which is in trouble. And if we don't tackle that, I think uh, democracy and uh, multilateralism I mean, is in trouble. I think that's an important point, and, and, and I want to sort of test you on this if I can, Espen, which is... You know, the, the, the day after, the morning after Brexit, I've been watching the BBC all night, and I pretty much knew as soon as Gitzet voted leave that we were on our way. I mean, it was fairly obvious which way it was going. The next morning in my Dutch village, which admittedly is a fairly mad Dutch village, but they're very nice people. <laughs> they were queuing up outside my door to congratulate Britain. They were queuing up. It wasn't just that the British had done this mad thing. They were actually saying, well done. And I was saying, well, actually, I think not a good idea, Charles. But, but you know, they were, they were, they were, they were, they were very keen on this. And one of the things that was being said to me was that our leaders only talk to each other; they don't talk to us. And do you think the process of Europeanisation has created a political caste 
that is so locked in its own debate that it has lost that link mm. with the population. Is that a fair criticism? Yeah, although I, yes, but I don't think it's the process of Europeanization. I think it's the way it's it's across international cooperation actually. Yeah. That that international cooperation, which is a good thing, which I'm very much in favor yeah, of, yeah, yeah. Uh, was formed in its modern way in times where leaders had names like Konrad Adenauer or Willy Brandt or right. Giscardistan, right. uh, 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 the, and and they embodied you know a broad political consensus nationally. And people assumed that if we send them to Brussels or New York or where Washington, they will probably represent us in a good way. I mean, I, I don't really yeah. understand all of it, but it's probably good because Adenauer says so or, yeah. or whoever. And, and, and that kind of, and then leaders eventually in later, uh, in the 90s and with the building of a much stronger institution, they started to, exactly, they started to assume that this trust was eternal. Yeah. They said, okay, this is not very popular, I know, but the EU has decided it, so we have to do it. Worked for a while. Yeah. But eventually people say, why are we then in this EU if they have all this? And, and, and don't get me wrong, I think many of these decisions were right. But I think the ability to explain throughout that this is meaningful for you, my dear voters, still, uh, was lost on the way because people took for granted that they had that uh, license to operate. Yeah. And now people are saying, hey guys, you went too far. Andrew, I mean... We almost assumed that it worked in America because you evolved into this. But does that still, does Washington still have to sway over the people that it once did? Trump would suggest not. As I listen to this conversation, I especially like what you said, Alts, about um, what I call a democracy deficit. And I don't mean by that that somehow our leaders are undemocratic. But I think we, we are in a phase where instead of listening to what's happening, mm in the country, um, we insist that the people don't get it. Yeah. So I read yeah. article after article about illiberal democracy, about populists, about all of that, every possible way but to push uh, away the concerns of the electorate. And in the process, what's happening ac actually is very sad, is the shrinking of the political middle in, in, in the conversation yeah. about where to go. So that in Germany, Willie and I were talking about this, five years ago, IFD did not exist, I believe. Today, it's the third largest party in the Bundestag. In my own country, uh, we had a primary with 16 really solid, some pretty outstanding establishment GOP guys, and they were trounced by uh, a, a candidate with no political experience of any kind, no clear credentials that he was really in the Reaganist camp or conservative or whatever. And yet evangelicals would vote for, for uh, candidate Trump even though he was divorced previously, even though he represents New York City uh, with everything that comes with it. Um, and my point is you ask, and, and got himself elected without taking a dime from the party. I mean. Ronald, uh, Donald Trump has already made history in that sense. Yeah. He is our first president, was never a politician, never a military officer. He got elected and not only delivered the House, the Senate, and the White House, but if you actually look at the transformation at the regional level of American politics, governorships, local legislatures, the GOP never had this kind of sweep since 1928. Moreover, he broke through the blue firewall in the Midwest. He took Michigan, he took Wisconsin, he took Pennsylvania things that were never supposed to happen. And I'm retelling this story for one reason, simply to say I think there's a race ongoing, not just in the US, but also in Europe, between whether and how quickly the leadership, the elite politicians, actually understand that some of the ideological assumptions that they have about how the world should be. And when I say they, I'm a part of that class. I sit on podiums here and I pontificate about how the world ought to be, and actually, adapt to the realm of the possible and understand that, you know, having a million people enter your country uh, in a year and then have people kind of object to this does not mean that they're racist or xenophobic. It's just that that influx in terms of absorption capacity will radically transform your community. My country has been historically accepting of, of immigrants. Our forefathers were kicked out of every decent country in Europe and in the world, right? I mean. And some of them we are right mutts. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. So, but jokes aside, if you think about it, why the why immigration, why build the wall became became such a powerful uh, battle cry? 
I think, again, because of the scope. And I would add one more thing. Europeans talk about integration. Uh, American pattern historically was one of acculturation. Yeah, yeah. Public and common schools were created to make Americans out of immigrants. If you, uh, we had a house in Wisconsin where the Scandinavian actually uh, community settled originally. In an old schoolhouse, I found some old papers where Swedes were talking about, now we're in America, we speak English, we learn American history, all these things. There was tremendous top-down elite pressure. Uh, and also our immigration system until 1965 had a quota built into it, which meant we took a lot of small numbers of people from a lot of countries and a lot of regions. So we didn't, it was easier to avoid what I called, and I wrote about it too, another plug for myself, is to avoid creating suspended communities, yeah. communities that are interacting with the, with the mainstream culture through these different points, but are self-reflecting, continue to speak you know, their native language and continue to preserve, and there's no pressure for them to repeat the immigrant pattern. When you come in, you build you know, a community around an Irish or Polish church, then the second generation breaks I mean, off and goes in. I mean, Andrew, I'm going to come to Ashton yeah. and to Henrik on this, but, but, but it, I, I am struck by what you say that you know, I'm searching for this issue of institutions, and it strikes me we're moving more and more away from classical international institutions and more to questions about the institutions of government itself. That almost, unless we can re-legitimize the institutions of government, including in our own countries, I fully agree. then the institutions that they aggregate themselves will not function. Asla. Well, I just wanted to pick up uh, on something that, um, uh, that, that Andrew put forth. And I think you're so right. But I think uh, this is a realization that most readers of the... Financial Times and the Economist have already arrived at saying, oh yes, uh, uh, we are now ready to pontificate and we have agreed amongst ourselves that you are indeed not racist. And now we will get on to the business of building the European <laughs> Union. And, even, uh, even if we think you really are. Uh, well, and, and, and the, the thing is, you know, like one of the most inspiring things I've ever experienced was uh, uh, back in the day, uh, just after uh, John Kerry had lost to George W. Bush, uh, uh, you know, John Kerry was one of the greatest men ever not to become president of the United States. He was a very good candidate, to my mind. We, uh, the students from the UK, went to the Democratic headquarters, and we were steaming over this, the nasty party. How nasty, you know, like they had tricked the voters. They had lied to them. You know, like, well, this negative, you know, like, it was, uh, it was, uh, we, we were very upset. And then the Democrats turned around and said, no. Uh, we lost this election, and we have to be honest about why, uh, about why we lost it. And they carried out a self-examination process That's that so was important. necessary to bring about a Barack Obama. Barack Obama, he took on some of the most difficult questions in American politics head-on, including the race question. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, later, Bush, uh, no, Trump did the same, but <laughs> from a different vantage point, admittedly. Um, uh, and I think that we need to get to that point. It's not enough to say... Uh, to go, oh dear, uh, we, we might have gone a little bit overboard when we called you all racist. Only some of you are. And then we need to, uh, to re-establish legitimacy. I think a big gesture is necessary, and that's where Henry comes in. And I think uh, Henry has always uh, been, a, uh, I think that has been very inspiring to me, and I think you're right about this one too. So we have to go be on, kind Henry. to our people. I, I think we need to do something excessive, <laughs> something grand, so, uh, you know, a big a big Post posture there to say the, the stuff. The stuff we said we were wrong. We were so, we, and we are going to. We're going to pour money into border control. We we're not we're, and we're not. Them. We're going to celebrate it. We're okay. going to have a, a national border control day, and we will and we will light you know like you know uh, 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 candles for border control, and we will you know like to over you know com communicate. If that is the, indeed the question, if you're right about whether now, immigration now, is the big now, issue. Now, Ashton, please don't give Brussels ideas. I mean, really. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I mean, I, the next thing we'll know, they'll be invading Britain. <laughs> and we will kick their asses. So that's, you know, the, inspire me, Henrik. <laughs> that's, a tall, that's, a, that's a tall order, Julian. Um, I think, I, I think, but I, but I think basically Asla has, has, has a big point here, is that, that, that in order to sort of refound uh, the citizens' confidence in the overall European project, not just and not to be conflated with the EU, we we need to actually solve problems together that people care about. And again, the most salient problem in the European 
performance, performance. But it, it's, there you it, go. It, but it's in, in many ways, in many ways, this is in, then, yeah. in many ways, this is very simple. Handling problems that, that people actually care about, and the, the one number one problem across Europe is still the issue of uncontrolled migration. And the promise of the Schengen area was we lift the internal border controls based on the premise that we will ensure the external border controls. And the second part of that, of that promise was not uh, upheld. Right now we're in a situation where we are giving money to Erdogan, who is, even if he's a staunch member of NATO, is also not very much of a Democrat. So we, the only reason why he's keeping two or three million or four million uh, uh, migrants from flowing into Europe is because we are basically paying him for it. Why don't we get our act together and make sure that we can control that situation ourselves? And that would, that would mean as a, a massive investment in, in border controls in the south of Europe and in the east of Europe. It would both mean building things, but also building new institutions. I think evidently the European Union should play uh, a, a part in this, but I think the vision has to come from the big, the big three. Yeah. That's, where, that's where the ideas come from. And then secondly, I think also, if you remember that the US Coast Guard is part of the US military, if we spend the money here, this also goes, goes towards the 2% issue. So, so, I mean, everybody will be happy, including the Americans. I mean, <laughs> yes, they might, but remember the Americans are never happy. So, no, what do you know? That's, that's, that's a, um, let me move this to the end because I, 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 we've got 10 minutes left. And what I want to do is I, I want to bring it back to the issue on the agenda, which is retreat or reform, can Western institutions survive? And I, I want you to close by giving me a sense of, of which institutions really matter in this new world into which we're moving. And how do they have to adapt to be effective? Because I sense, listening to Leanne Collin over, over, over this last 24 hours, that if Europeans think they can pontificate endlessly, as we have done for many, many years now, and the world somehow around Europe will not change, that's a big mistake. We haven't got much time if we are to establish legitimate European influence over a changing world. And I really want to get your sense of how can we ensure that our institutions, because the institutions that we Europeans have, and the Americans are separate from this, are the only way that we can exert influence over this world. So what and how do we adapt them to that end? And I'm going to go in reverse order. Andrew, if you'd be so kind as to kick off with okay. your concluding remarks. Uh, uh, could I add one component to this? Because Certainly we talk not. about inst okay, <laughs> we talk about institutions, of course. but the institutions are ultimately only as good as the people who fill them, and, and, and we've yeah. never touched on this larger V word values. You know, our general culture, our concept of ourselves. Yeah, yeah. I will not try to predict where the EU is going to end up. I think it's going to be much rougher than many of the people expect because of the shrinking uh, willingness on the part of the electorates to actually go ahead and, and allow for the current uh, situation to continue. NATO is what concerns me most because I think its value is greatest, both for Europe and for the United States, especially as we are increasingly in a world where we have state-on-state -state competition emerging uh, as one of the key tasks that we will have. And our resources need to be combined in order to ensure the, the stability. Uh, of the system and the preservation of, of the kind of order that we have put in place since the end of the Second World War. So I would focus and I would simply say that leadership, both in Europe and in the United States, will be needed. Uh, and real leadership and a commitment of resources, the, the willingness to actually take the heat, spend the money, um, create a shared sense of, of, of commitment, if you will, to common defense, that will be the test for NATO. Mm. If, if, mm. if the people who are leading the alliance, of the people who are leading different European capitals and in, in Washington maintain that commitment, uh, then I think NATO will restructure and emerge from this, you know, where the legacy institutions will be transformed and will be able to, to respond. On Europe, I'm deeply concerned about the kind of constant repetition uh, of we're going to rebuild the core, we're going to have a two-tier, we will do this and then the other. Everything that we've achieved since the day that the Berlin Wall fell, which was essentially creating Europe whole, free, and in peace, yeah. forgive the cliche, mm -hmm. is now up for renegotiation. And, uh, and to argue that somehow it is no problem to create a two-tiered Europe, mm -hmm. in effect to disconnect, uh, uh, to some extent, the flanks from, from uh, the Eurozone, I think to me that's a very uh, unfortunate way of mm -hmm. thinking about it. 
So you cannot create institutions as an antidote to power. No, you can't. And I keep saying you, uh, there's more that unites post-communist Europe, traditional Carolingian Europe, the South, than actually divides those mm. nations and the inability to negotiate a compromise rather than insisting that certain things have to, have to adhere to the model that's been developed in Brussels. And it goes back to the question of legitimacy. Um, I was making this little joke here. We work for our citizens. Yeah. I mean, and that is something that has to be remembered. And whether I or Julian think that where the electorate wants to go makes sense or doesn't make sense is ultimately immaterial, because what is material is where the electorate wants to take the country. Correct. And if we don't respond to this as, as, as leaders and policy elites and whatnot, then we will become irrelevant. If elites do not respect votes, then democracy dies. People, fellow, my fellow Remainers in Britain might want to think about that right now. Um, Carolingian, that takes me back. Asla. Retreat or reform? Uh, NATO certainly needs to retreat uh, from Afghanistan. I think NATO is um, it's on the right path, frankly. I think uh, the rever um, bringing up military spending in Europe, bringing a focus back to the Atlantic, I think NATO will, will be in pretty good shape. The only thing that NATO can't live without is American support. And, uh, well, it seems that uh, Donald Trump has, has decided, the president has decided that NATO is, is, wor is worthwhile after all. And so I think NATO will be fine. I think for, uh, for the EU, the EU is in the biggest trouble here because yeah, the EU needs yeah. to reform and it's desperately difficult to uh, reform uh, in a context where uh, with eroded leg legitimacy and the pressures uh, arising from a great many um, controversial questions uh, that have been left unresolved, uh, so to speak. I think uh, the problem for the EU to some extent was that it enlarged a Western club without really taking the ambitions and the views of new members on board. They were just, we've just said, hey, come on, come on board and, and you will, you know, like have your little desk. Uh, and the, the, the problem is that behind the question of migration, which I, I agree is overshadowing a lot of, a lot of other issues, it, there is an issue in the EU that the British are leaving, making the EU less of a liberal pro-free uh, pro trade organization. The EU, the Britain, Brits have always been sort of the torchbearers for that. And at the same time, without really acknowledging or legitimizing uh, the deeper political trends in Eastern Europe. And we're talking about a country like Poland with 40 right. million people. That's and right. I think these are the sort of reforms that the EU needs to do. It needs to get in a better sync with uh, the states that comprise the, uh, the EU and the people who make up the populace in these, in these states. And that's going to be damn difficult because uh, the biggest thinker in uh, Europe, on Europe today, is Emmanuel Macron, a man who, through his youthful exuberance, is eager to sort of get up and at it without doing all that boring stuff. You know, he might do it in France, but, but you know, like, he's not going to ask the Poles what they really want. You know, like, he already knows what they want, you know. And that, I think, is going to be a challenge to bring some yeah, cold-hearted realism into the... I have to say, as, a, as an Englishman, and no, with no disrespect to my French colleagues, but another Frenchman with a big idea. <laughs> um, Henrik. <laughs> well, when you, when you board an airplane, there's always a voice droning on about things you should do and not do. And one of the most important sentences is that if the air pressure should drop, uh, an oxygen mask will fall in front of your face. And then it says, always remember to put it on yourself before helping others. And I think that's the <laughs> essential question <laughs> that goes to the southern flank. <laughs> so in, in terms of the question of institutional reform, what to do about it? Well, I think, I think we don't need new institutions. The old ones will never really go away. So we basically have to reconfigure them. But I think Looking at the southern flank as a new strategic task is also an opportunity for especially NATO and EU cooperation. And as I said, I think there's a, there's a possibility for wonderful synergy here. The EU can take care of all of the coordination and the civilian stuff, and NATO can build a Coast Guard uh, border uh, side arm, and thus, thus living more up to the 2% than, this, this uh, than before. This Coast Guard of yours is going to be side, the size of the Grand Fleet at this rate. I'm, I'm very Definitely, impressed. definitely. And, 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 I'm, and I'm afraid also we will also, and, and this is where it gets, gets get, getting back to the hot political potato, right? We will also have to build a wall. And that is part of, of building a border and, and taking care of the, of the limits of the empire. Look at your Roman history. A Danish Look at your Roman history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go on, Espen. 
serving minister, politician, give wow. us a way forward. Give us inspiration, <laughs> my friend. A couple of, uh, yeah. yeah. In, in the, um, uh, in Acopolypsis now, the movie, there's this uh, crazy colonel, I think, is, who Jeffrey, says that yeah. uh, in, uh, Kurt, yeah. Kurt yeah, uh, yeah. inside every geek, there's an American wanting to come out. Yeah. <laughs> and Which is I, true. <laughs> true. And I think when when the Berlin Wall fell, we had a, a more sophisticated version, which is that people in Eastern Europe are people just like us who yeah. were unfortunately captured on the wrong side of the Iron Curtain. They are now free. They were, they are instant West Europeans. Uh, and frankly, the first and I worked a lot with those governments when they were on their way to NATO and and, and the EU, and that was the impression you got because almost every single government came across as highly Western, highly liberal, highly modern, uh, partly because all the people who composed them had been studying in America or the UK or in Germany or somewhere else, and, and were actually embodiment of this, and, and it, it was really impressive. Now, we, what we sh all have, they and we, should have thought about was did we, these societies, because of communism, had not been through the same process of internalizing and reflecting on what happened in the, in the Second World War and that Germany more than anybody else, but basically all Western countries to a certain extent have done. So only late we come to realize that we hadn't had that political cultural adaptation that did happen in the original EU uh, NATO members hadn't happened there. That's a problem. We see it in the current discussion on yeah. Poland on uh, designation of, uh, of uh, death camps like Auschwitz and whether they are Polish or German or Nazi or what. But it's just, as, just an example of a bigger issue which, which lies in there, which is problematic for the unity of Europe. I am enough of a liberal institutionalist to think that Europe can only succeed if we believe in the European project as human rights, uh, rule of law, uh, you know, uh, tolerance, um, competitive democracy, uh, market economy. If we if we com compromise on that, we might as might as well not try because yeah. then then the, the the purpose is gone. But there is so I think really the institution that really needs to re-establish itself is the state, because the, the because the state has to, all states in Europe and America has to capture this new problem that we've been discussing with the haves and haves not uh, and the very different attitudes to foreigners and so on in a way that recalibrates some kind of sense of we so that once again one can confidently go and say we have certain things we want to share with you this other community that has something you know to share on the climate or free, free trade area so I, I think very it comes down to core politics That's right. and, and and maybe starting in brussels whether it's the uh, brussels in town or out by the motorway is the wrong way to start. You have to go to the core essential building block, which remains the state. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, but it would be good to tell the Commission, for example, not to see the state as a competitor, but to work with it rather than try to replace it, which is, I think, part of the problem. Not? I'm not going to summarise this. It's been a fantastic discussion, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Um, learned so much, and join me in saying thank you. Thank you. Kate. Uh, first of all, thank you for a brilliant discussion. This was uh, really um, very interesting to listen to, and I think you have wrapped up all the questions we asked yesterday and that we discussed in a deep length. Uh, very um, elegant. Um, I brought you all here when it's 10 minus, a lot of snow, so I give you mittens. Ah. The ones who come from abroad. A Norwegian mitten. Sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. It's Thank you handmade. So they don't have there mittens in Germany. <laughs> they don't make them like this in the US. Look at this. So. They're beautiful. In Minnesota. Thank you. You can go and buy some new books. Uh, and you, and you have got your gift. Already, yeah, thank you very much. But uh, it's time for me uh, to uh, close uh, this uh, Leon Colin Security Conference. It's been excellent uh, speakers, uh, good debates and discussions, and I hope you all have enjoyed it. Um, but I have to say, bringing together 24 speakers from 11 different airports internationally in the middle of February in Norway. It's uh, a huge logistic operation for an NGO of four persons, mm -hmm. me included. So um, 
I really will like my crew to come up, Karn Anna, Magnus and Camilla come here. I give them really, come on. Konana has been uh, the driving force behind the Leon Cohen Security Conference 2018. She has uh, sent mails to all these people that you have listened to and really have done a fabulous work. And Camilla and Magnus, of course, has worked late hours, late night, weekends, and uh, tomorrow we are going to enjoy a lazy day in the office. Get drunk. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, on the other hand, we wouldn't be, have been able to um, do this conference uh, to serve you, to um, answer all your questions without uh, having of a yata organizations, other organizations for the youth, Atlanticist. We have 15 volunteers. They come from Bergen, from Trondheim, from Oslo. This is the future, ladies and gentlemen. Please come in. Come on. So, I think maybe Leon Cohen Security Conference in 2035, some of you will sit in the podium and I will maybe sit in the audience. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for Thank you. Thank you. this Thank you. year. Thank you. Yeah. My colleagues and I, your foreign guests, <laughs> uh, we attend many of these type of conferences. But we've all agreed that under your leadership, Lian Collins has become one of the jewels in the crown of the an annual circuit. You're here. So uh, we would like to <laughs> congratulate you. Thank you. <laughs>